Christian Bible begins with the story of the Garden of Eden, and beginning with it is a tradition of religious guilt and shame which has unfortunately left its mark on millions of people around the world, including my younger self. Fitting then that the key to unlocking such religious guilt, at least for me, can be found in the reinterpretation of that first of biblical myths. And a myth it is, not in the sense of the word which means falsehood or erroneous belief, but in the classic sense of the word, which was used to describe stories whose metaphors and symbols work a transformative effect on the listener. Ideas are the most powerful things in existence, and sacred mythology is the means by which our most potent, illuminating, and timeless ideas are conveyed. Like a sharp sword, the power of such myths can cut many ways, and the Garden of Eden myth is exceptional in its ability to bind the human spirit it or to free it, depending on how it is interpreted or reinterpreted. The traditional or forwards telling of the Garden of Eden myth goes like this. God Almighty creates the world and everything in it over the course of six days, with mankind coming on that sixth and final day. First, God makes Adam. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Eve comes next, with God causing Adam to fall into a deep sleep so he can do a little weird surgery. God pulls a rib from Adam's side and from it fashions Eve, the first woman. I'm not sure how that works exactly, but creation myths are often strange. Anyway, the narrative of Genesis places Adam and Eve in the beautific paradise garden called Eden, of course, where they spend their days naming the animals and walking around naked and shameless. There's only one thing they aren't allowed to do, which is to eat from this one very special tree in the center of the garden. God even tells them that they will die if they eat of its fruit. But then one day, along comes the serpent and convinces Eve to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree, despite God's very stern warning. Eve then shares it with Adam, and in response, God comes down down from heaven and punishes them quite thoroughly, kicking them out of the Garden of Eden and into the cruel world where they will know disease and toil and death and all sorts of nasty things that all of us are quite familiar with. The Jehovah God of Genesis actually goes so far as to curse the ground and decree that henceforth, women shall have painful and risky childbirth, amongst other nasty retributions. The serpent, meanwhile, is cursed to crawl on the ground without legs, which it apparently had before this time. That would make it more like a salamander, really, but I digress. The punishment and banishment is total, so total, that mankind has supposedly existed in a fallen state ever since, cut off in some sense from God and his holiness. This is why, according to Christian doctrine, or more specifically Protestant Christian doctrine, every human born since the, quote, fall of man is supposedly born into sin and stamped with a sinful nature, and are therefore in need of the sacrifice of a blameless man, Jesus Christ, to stand in for their sins so they might gain admittance to heaven. Protestant Christianity is specifically defined by this belief that salvation, i.e. going to heaven when you die, is obtained only through this sacrifice of Jesus. And this belief hinges on the idea that the Garden of Eden story constitutes the fall of man. Interpreted this way, it's kind of a bummer of a story. We used to have this awesome paradise, but we didn't manage to keep it very long. And worse yet, this interpretation of the Garden of Eden story places the burden of atonement for millennia-old sin on the shoulders of each one of us, even before our own sin has been accounted for. It's metaphor as cudgel, used to drive home the basic idea that people are just bad and in need of salvation from a higher power, or at the least, from his faithful advocates on Earth. principle being outlined here at the beginning of the Bible is the sin-punishment dynamic, the idea that virtue is based on adherence to rules and norms, which I would label as a fairly grim and even authoritarian-leaning worldview. God's will is being expressed as a negative reinforcement mechanism, essentially compelling obedience by threat of punishment, and this puts the emphasis on stasis, even creating a virtue out of it. This would stand in contrast to, say, an exhortation of intentional creative action to catalyze growth and dynamism, just to pull a few words out of my pocket. This basic concept of hierarchy is also spelled out in the pre-fallen Eden, where mankind is given dominion over the rest of creation, just as God has dominion over, well, everything. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. 
So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. All right, so God makes man in his image, giving him authority over the animals and plants of the creation and the right to subdue them, just as God has absolute dominion over everything and the right to subdue everything. It's a distinctly top-down philosophy. Things that you rule over must be subdued and controlled. Ultimately, I find that the Garden of Eden story is about free will and inspiration, and God Almighty seems to be punishing those things in favor of maintaining the established hierarchical order. Now, when they teach you this story in Sunday school, the thing that is emphasized is that Eden was originally a place without sin, with Adam and Eve walking and talking with God and essentially not even comprehending the idea of sinning. That's why they didn't need to wear clothes. Their nudity symbolizes their innocence, and after committing the sin of eating from the tree, their need to suddenly cover their nakedness is supposed to represent their newfound shame. This reality is emphasized by the full name of the tree of which mankind is not supposed to eat, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This name implies that before eating of the fruit, mankind had no knowledge of good and evil, which means we can think of Adam and Eve as being in something of an automaton, animal-like state. They don't have a choice to sin because they aren't aware of sin. They don't have the knowledge of good and evil, after all. We could say that they lack free will, but I think the more correct way to say it is that they lacked the inspiration to exercise free will. Now, perhaps mankind could have existed this way in perpetual sheep-like bliss for millennia upon millennia, satisfying God with our very boring and obedient behavior. But along comes the serpent to throw a wrench into things, as we know. And here I will quote Genesis 3 for the exact wording. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. All right, well, it looks like the serpent spoke truly, didn't it? The only thing that died was their innocence and ignorance, their former state of mind which knew not the burden of morality, of discerning between good and evil. Eating of the fruit of the tree, which was to be desired to make one wise, has now opened their eyes, which is just a way of alluding to Adam and Eve becoming conscious of things they previously were not. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, by definition, has now expanded Adam and Eve's perception, and in this way, made mankind more like God, or more like a God. Indeed, the end of Genesis 3 has God Almighty adding a very interesting mental note to self. Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. It seems God was worried that mankind was on their way to becoming a little too like him. First, the knowledge of good and evil, and then immortality from the tree of life. God certainly couldn't allow such a challenge. We all know how he handled that uppity Lucifer fellow, after all. Tossed him right out of heaven. More on this in a moment. Now I'd like to ask you to stop and consider just how heinous the actions of God Almighty really are concerning the tree of knowledge. I would put forth that it's nothing less than the criminalization of higher consciousness. The expansion of consciousness and self-perception that was triggered by the eating of the fruit caused Adam and Eve to become what we would call fully self-aware. They became capable of deciding for themselves what the rules are and how they should be followed. But this was the original sin of mankind? The eating of the food of the gods is actually a classic mythical trope, or mytheme, and it's usually regarded as a good thing, as a necessary step on mankind's lurching path towards enlightenment. 
On an evolutionary scale, it can be seen to symbolize the development of the mind of modern man. The, quote, knowledge of good and evil is really just one way of trying to describe that which makes us different from animals, or even from archaic man. Look, we're making loincloths now. For our creator to label such development as the highest sin, for him to so severely punish the yearning for enlightenment and free will, seems cruel beyond comprehension. I would argue that reaching for the stars is fundamental to mankind's nature. Curiosity and the desire to understand the world around us and our place in it are the things that drive us to do more than simply perpetuate our own existence. To put it simply, we humans have evolved over time from the darkness of animal-like existence to the illumination of full self-perception. But the Garden of Eden myth stamps this as the original sin of man which caused us to, quote, fall. But did mankind really fall with the eating of the fruit? Or was leaving the garden actually a giant leap forwards towards determining our own destiny, which may in fact be the mastery of free will itself? Think about it. Eden is presented as a paradise, but it's also something of a prison from which mankind ultimately had to seek liberation. It could also be seen as representing a womb or childhood, and that it represents a safe and secure place that shielded us, but one from which we must inevitably emerge to confront the outside world with all its trials and tribulations. For better or worse, that's what the responsibility of free will brings. But the alternative is to remain in a state without free will, and that ultimately must be understood as a kind of prison if it were to exist in perpetuity. As God originally intended. Hmm. What then do we say about this God who wanted to keep us from that destiny, to keep us in a lower form, more like that of an animal? A God who literally cursed us in the ground we walk on, because we dared to seize for ourselves the power to determine right from wrong. Well, the Gnostic Christians of medieval Europe, who had some very different ideas about Christianity than the Orthodox folks, thought of the Jehovah God of Genesis as a demiurge, which is something like an evil god or a powerful demon. The Gnostics saw the physical realm as a testing ground for the spirit. And this demiurge, Jehovah, who sought to keep us from evolving to a higher level of consciousness was, to them, evil. And you can kind of see their point, right? The Garden of Eden tale describes a jealous, defensive, angry, and vindictive God, flat out. And if eating of the Tree of Knowledge represents the basic concept of pushing the evolution of mankind forward, well, then we have to conclude, as the Gnostics did, that there is something pretty twisted about the God in this story. Now, I do want to emphasize that I view all deities as sacred, mythical constructs as opposed to literal entities, which basically just means that I believe we should think of them as embodying certain ideas or principles that humans consider sacred or important. In this case, I am suggesting that the Jehovah of Genesis is essentially embodying these concepts of hierarchy and stasis, not to mention patriarchy, which we'll also discuss momentarily, and that these concepts are being wrongly expressed as virtues. What I'm calling these misguided virtues are, in my opinion, the mechanism by which shame and guilt are conveyed upon the believer. But the good news is that they are obscuring a deeper and more fundamental truth of this myth, which has the ability to remove this guilt and to empower the human spirit. What is this more fundamental truth? Well, it's the one we've been sneaking up to. That eating of the food of the gods, for better or worse, should be seen as necessary and ultimately inevitable, as a courageous step forward for all humanity. That it shouldn't be demonized, literally demonized and blamed on Satan, but rather celebrated. It may be in our nature to sin, to miss the mark, but it's also in our nature to strive for a greater understanding of ourselves and the world around us. I think what we really need to concern ourselves with is continuing to strive for greater collective wisdom, understanding, and empathy, so that we might more correctly discern between good and evil. After all, the world we live in is essentially a sum total of the consequences of all of our choices, so there's really nothing more important than improving our knowledge of good and evil. So let's talk about that serpent a bit. If the Jehovah God of Genesis is actually playing the role of the bad guy, as the Gnostics suggest, the one trying to keep our collective human consciousness from leaping forward, does that make the serpent the good guy? The one trying to help mankind evolve? Earlier, I was pulling words out of my pocket, and I mentioned that as an opposite to the obedience and stasis as a virtue ethos expressed by Jehovah, we might look for an exhortation of intentional creative action to catalyze growth and dynamism. 
And that's exactly the role that the serpent plays, exactly the virtues its figure is expressing. The serpent encourages Eve to take an action that was within her power, but which she lacked the inspiration to conceive of and or act upon. The serpent tells her to, you know, consider the fruit again, despite what she's been told by God. And only then does Eve see, quote, that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. The serpent brings the illumination of truth, that she will not die, but have her eyes opened, and that she'll learn how to make loincloths. And then the serpent exhorts her to take this power into her own hands. Eve does, and eating of the fruit does indeed catalyze growth and expand her consciousness, making Eve a kind of Neil Armstrong, one giant leap forward for mankind figure in this alternate reading of the tale. Now, in terms of symbolic role, I would say that the serpent would seem to represent creative inspiration and higher awareness. It's playing the role of a light bearer here, holding aloft a lantern, which guides Eve and Adam, meaning humanity, on the only path which leads out of this animal-like state. And of course, the Latin word Lucifer refers to the planet Venus and is synonymous with the phrases light bearer, bringer of light, and so on. Thank God for the devil, huh? Let me just dodge the lightning strike here. Now, I'm just being playful with words, of course. But seriously, within the syntax of this story, we can say that it's a good thing that the serpent came along to show us the way, right? A good thing that, at various points in our history, people have been struck with the creative inspiration to take some great leap forward. The serpent is the catalyzing force which turns the tables on the Edenic stasis that God had created, spurring on the greatest leap forward of them all, the leap to full modern self-awareness. Mankind emerged from his garden womb to take the first shaky steps on the road to figuring out precisely what the hell was going on in the world. And history was made, or at least symbolically represented through fable. So if the serpent represents concepts like inspiration, creativity, and higher awareness, then once again we must take note of the fact that God curses the serpent along with humanity and reflect. As I mentioned, many cultures around the world have a version of the food of the gods, fire of the gods story, a legend attempting to describe the great leap forward of humanity to the higher order consciousness of modern man. And the Garden of Eden myth is basically a weird cousin of this family, where the acquisition of the knowledge of the gods is not celebrated, but rather demonized. Many other versions of this type of story do include the punishment element, of course. Prometheus is probably the most well-known example here. But even the cruel punishment of Prometheus is contrasted with the acknowledgement of his role in creating modern man by bringing the fire of the gods down to earth. Jealous and vindictive Zeus, like the Jehovah of Genesis, also curses humanity to have to work much, much harder in retaliation for the stealing of his fire. So you can see how similar the tales really are. But no one ever mentions Eve in the same breath as Prometheus, and they should. I think most people would probably name Zeus the villain of the Prometheus story, the one who wants to jealously keep humanity from obtaining fire and advancing. And I believe the Jehovah of Genesis, or at least the ideals his character represents, can be seen in much the same way, just as the Gnostics suggested. To add another mythical corollary, you could almost say that Eve is a bit like Odin, the Norse god of shamanic magic and many other things. Odin also walks up to a magical tree, Yggdrasil, and ingests a substance which expands his consciousness. Odin is drinking from the well of Mimir instead of eating an apple from the tree, but the well of Mimir is one of the three magical wells from which the tree Yggdrasil grows, so it's still the same concept. And just as Adam and Eve, representing humanity, pay a heavy price for gaining the knowledge that made them like gods, and just as Prometheus does the same, Odin must sacrifice one of his physical eyes for the privilege of drinking from Mimir's well, which opens his third eye, meaning that it greatly increases his magical knowledge and power. A similar tale of Odin paying a heavy price to gain magical knowledge and power also involves the magical world tree Yggdrasil. In that tale, Odin hangs from the tree for nine days and nights, then dies, at least in some sense, only to defeat death, see the runes, and emerge the most powerful god in the cosmos, who can then use Yggdrasil to traverse the nine realms. There's definitely more than a whiff of the crucifixion story here, and I plan to discuss that fully in the future. But the point I want to make for now is that, like Eve or Prometheus, Odin can be seen as a representation of humanity's attempt to wrestle with the issue of higher consciousness. I'll also add that the the mythical world tree is another mytheme well worth its own study, and that its appearance in the Garden of Eden story is a major clue that this first tale of Genesis should be seen as a classic obtaining the fire of the gods story, along the lines of the stories of Prometheus or Odin. Mm -hmm.
Another wonderful and uplifting thing about this reinterpretation of the Garden of Eden myth is that it cures the story of its explicit patriarchy. I am thinking of lines like Genesis 2.18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. This line, along with another one we're about to read, can be, and is, interpreted to indicate man's primacy over woman, as is the fact that Adam was created first from the earth itself, while Eve was created afterward from Adam's rib. Not quite as glorious, made from a rib instead of the entire earth. On top of that, she was created to keep Adam company, as it says. It gets even worse when Eve is blamed for the great fall in Genesis 3, 16 through 19. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Well, that was a little grim. Anyway, as you can see, it was all because Adam made the mistake of listening to his wife. I mean, that's certainly a direct implication of what's written here, right? And there's really no ambiguity about, he shall rule over you, said in response to Eve being blamed for all this, now is there? Of course, I'm not really breaking any news to say that many of the old world's religions, particularly the monotheistic religions, tend to skew towards patriarchy. But what's really interesting here is that the justification for ordering society along the lines of patriarchy is actually written into the creation myth. And also that it disappears if we decide that eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge was a courageous and heroic act. Because that's exactly what happens, as I alluded to earlier. Eve becomes rightly recognized as the innovator and trail blazer of humanity. She becomes representative of attributes like courage, creativity, brilliance, and aspiration. Very like the serpent, actually, who really just represents the inspiration of Eve. I don't think it's meant to represent an external entity, just as God doesn't really represent an external entity, but rather a concept. And like the serpent, Eve also plays a facilitator role, because just as soon as she finds enlightenment through the Tree of Knowledge, she turns around and guides Adam on his path to the same. This is a very Buddhist principle, actually. The progression from attaining wisdom and insight to being able to share it with others. And I simply love that it's hiding right here in the Garden of Eden story. Very like a Buddha, Eve is showing us the path to enlightenment. She's following the call of divine inspiration and ascending the world tree to higher levels of consciousness. And she's beckoning us to follow, holding out the fruit. A true goddess hiding here in the garden in the first pages of Genesis. <laughs> Okay, now here's a bit of a curveball that demonstrates just how flexible and adaptable mythology can be. Now, I've just said all this about how the traditional Protestant Christian interpretation of the Genesis story is essentially backwards, demonizing all the wrong ideals. But at the same time, there are also ways to read the myth forwards and actually still get something insightful out of it. For example, if we set aside the question of whether or not the serpent is the good guy or the bad guy, and also some of the heavy-handed punishment stuff, we can see a story that is warning us about the dangers and responsibilities that come with free will. I mean, it's true, when people try to discern between good and evil, we don't always get it right. Some people abandon even an attempt to discern right from wrong and give themselves over wholly to self-interest. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. And if we think about the Garden of Eden as representing childhood or the womb, then it's true. There is a level of innocence and safety that dies when we move on to the next phase of life. It can also be observed that when we humans try to break new ground and push boundaries, there is often a cost. Whenever we discover a new world-shaping technology, whether that be the advent of steel in the ancient world or the emergence of chemistry and biology in the modern world, the character of humanity is essentially put to the test. These new technologies, or really just any form of power or knowledge, can generally be used to better humanity or to increase the level of suffering and death in the world. 
That, to me, is always the lesson of these Fire of the Gods stories. With great power and knowledge comes great responsibility. Still, boundaries must be pushed, new discoveries will be made, and childhood must be left behind. That's why I say that humanity's collective task could be stated as learning to master the awesome power of free will and self-determination. Here's something else we can get out of the Garden of Eden story without flipping it around and inverting it entirely. Forget for a moment everything I just said about the garden seeming like a paradise, but ending up like a prison because we had to forego free will in order to stay there. And just think about the simple, mythical idea of the primordial garden, which really just represents Earth itself in its wild, uncorrupted state. Sometimes I find it's helpful to strip away the particulars of a myth and just look at the raw symbols and elements of the story. And in this case, we can look at the broad strokes of Genesis and see a story of mankind falling out of harmony with nature. That's a story we can find in other cultures as well, because much like the great anthropological leap forward, man's relationship with nature is a defining aspect of our existence, which has evolved as we have evolved, and has therefore been the topic of mythmakers and storytellers around the world and through time. So what does the Garden of Eden story have to say about our relationship to nature? Well, I think it's interesting to note that right after passing out of the state of harmony with nature that defines the primordial garden mytheme, there's a reference to the advent of farming. Mankind is condemned by God to have to, quote, till the ground from which he was taken, which is suggested as a new task given to man after being booted from the garden. The Garden of Eden existence, on the other hand, looks a lot like the gatherer part of hunter-gatherer. So one could read Genesis as the story of man moving from one way of life to the other, towards mastering and shaping nature as opposed to living in harmony with it. No, I'm not one to necessarily attribute all of man's ills to the urban lifestyle that came with the rise of agriculture, but you can certainly pin a couple of them on that, and you can also see why some could make that greater argument. And it's possible that this idea is being expressed in the progression of human culture found in these first chapters of Genesis. This commentary on man's relationship to nature actually fits with the other interpretations of the Genesis story we've made. Once again, we can say that the progression here is inevitable. Humans were probably always destined to move from hunter-gatherer civilization to farming, and certainly it was necessary for the development of human culture. Once again, the key issue becomes one of responsibility and discernment. It's not that farming is necessarily bad or inherently good, but that farming should be done consciously and with respect for the various food chains and ecosystems of which our natural environment is comprised. We as humankind should never turn our back on nature and its wisdom, and when we do, we do so at our own peril. That's certainly a valid and valuable lesson to carry with us as we go. Alright, so I don't totally hate everything about the traditional interpretation of the Garden of Eden myth. I mean, I definitely think that turning things around to celebrate the eating of the fruit is the most powerful telling of the story, but as you've just seen, it's undeniable that one can also gain wisdom from some of these other interpretations as well. And that, at the end of the day, is actually the larger point I want to make. The idea that has the power to set people free from dogma and from religious fundamentalist interpretations of sacred mythology. After all, when one can find validity in so many different interpretations of a single tale, how then can anyone claim to have a monopoly on the truth of any given story? In my opinion, religious fundamentalism errs by interpreting stories which are primarily metaphorical and symbolic in nature as being literal, or as being statements of dogma. And when I use the word dogma, I'm essentially referring to the ideas or beliefs which become tantamount to membership within a group. If I may be so bold, I would venture to say that religious texts and sacred myths aren't really intended for delineating heretics from true believers, but rather for working a personal transformation on those willing to read them and meditate upon them. When someone tries to make dogma out of a sacred myth, what they're essentially doing is trying to pin it down and fix it in place, to permanently enshrine for all time what the orthodox meaning is. Doing so attempts to rob the myth of dynamism and depth in favor of rigidity, but the myths and fables that form the backbone of religions and cultural belief sets are living, breathing entities, and they resist such treatment with vigor. The Council of Nicaea enshrined the modern translation of the Bible, which dictates that eating of the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge was the fall of man all the way back in AD 325, and I highly recommend Bart D. Ehrman's book Misquoting Jesus for more on that. However, we can still see the traces of a classic, Humanity Reaches for the Fire of the Gods story shining through. 
Although we can't know the intent of the original Genesis author, supposedly it was Moses, a man so ancient as to be more a figure of legend than of history, but I would put forth that the celebration of the acquisition of the fire of the gods, or food of the gods, is the oldest version of this universal myth, and that the demonization of the eating of the fruit in the official interpretation of the Genesis story is the mutation, the changed form. The thing is, in a way, it doesn't matter. I mean, it does matter, but in a way it doesn't. Because what's most important to understand is that all forms of symbolic communication and symbolic art are esoteric in nature, which simply means that they do not communicate their truths in a straightforward manner or by direct instruction, but by enfolding them within the layers of their substance. Sacred myths are tools for study and reflection, and hopefully transcendence. Those who try to fix their form into weapons for bludgeoning others who think differently are essentially defiling the sacred temple of man, which I think of as our collective body of stories, texts, and works of art which attempt to further our understanding of the universe and our place in it. To put it even more simply, Comparative mythology and comparative religion are absolutely terrific things for everyone to study. They can even act as cures for a lot of the worst effects of dogmatic religion, such as guilt, shame, anger, alienation, and so on. And you don't even need to go to college to study comparative religion. Though if you find yourself at college, by all means, definitely enroll in any classes along these lines. But I absolutely feel that it does everyone a tremendous amount of good to study religious texts and myths from other cultures. It helps to put your own cultural beliefs into context, whether you still believe in those beliefs or not. And it really highlights the universality of wisdom and of the human experience. When you realize that the myth of the primordial garden, the Christ man, or the global flood can be found all over the world in different versions, you begin to see how silly and flat out wrong it is for anybody to try to turn any one interpretation or lesson of a sacred myth into dogma into the one acceptable orthodox interpretation. I mean, just look at how much we've gleaned from considering the classic story of Adam and Eve from multiple angles. And you better believe that any good sacred myth has the potential to similarly unfold with layers of transformational, catalyzing wisdom when studied with eyes trained for symbolism, archetype, and metaphor. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the power of sacred myth. Hey everyone, it's David, and thanks for watching my video. If you liked the subject matter, good news. I'm writing a book about it. It's called Paradise Gained, Christianity, Sacred Symbolism, and Freedom from Dogma. I'm really excited about it, not only because it's my first book, but because this is basically everything I've learned from researching symbolism and mythology over the last five years of having a YouTube channel. And these are really the ideas that set me free from dogma and shame, just like I was talking about in the video. I really think these ideas are powerful and they can shine a lot of light into the world. And I'm asking you guys to help me do it. So go on over to Indiegogo and look up Paradise Gained by David Beers, or just follow the link in the description of the video below. In case you're wondering where all this lovely flamenco guitar comes from, that's my friend John Walsh, and you can find his music on the John Walsh Guitar YouTube channel. Don't forget to make sure you're subscribed to this channel, and please leave a comment below, share the video with anyone you think might like it, and I'll see you next time.